Welcome everyone. My name is Keen Fitzgerald. I am the IIA's researcher on security and defense, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this IIA webinar on open source intelligence and the war in Ukraine, which is a part of the IIA's ongoing work on security and defense. Open source intelligence or OSINT, intelligence gathered using publicly available data, has changed how we think about intelligence gathering and secrecy. Though it is not a novel form of intelligence tradecraft, the proliferation of technologies ranging from social media to publicly available satellite data has ushered in an era where intelligence gathering is no longer the preserve of secret intelligence agencies and has, in a sense, become democratized. This presents new opportunities, but also creates new risks. In this new context, we're delighted to be joined today by George Barros, the Russia team and geospatial intelligence team lead on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War based in Washington, DC. George will speak to us for about 20 minutes and then I'll open the floor to questions from the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen below. And you should please note that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel, to please feel free to join the discussion using X and please, please be sure to use the handle at IIEA. I'll now give George a full introduction and hand then hand over to him. George Barros is the Russia team and geospatial intelligence team lead on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War. He focuses on Russian information operations, the Kremlin's operational art and campaign design in Ukraine and Belarus, and Ukrainian politics. His work within the geospatial intelligence team focuses on innovating, innovating ISWs or the Institute for the Study of War's open source research methodology with remote sensing data collection, data visualization, and geospatial analysis. George received his BA with honors in international relations and global studies with a concentration in Russian and post-Soviet studies from the College of William and Mary. Prior to joining the Institute for the Study of War, he worked in the US House of Representatives as an advisor on Ukraine and Russia for a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. George, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Kian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to this, be here and speak with you. Um, when, when Kian reached out to me some weeks ago to discuss uh, open source intelligence as uh, an intelligence discipline and its importance, I, I found it very interesting. Because generally, when I give these sort of talks, I usually don't talk about the process. I talk about the final result. That is, I, I talk about the actual intelligence assessments we arrived at. Um, so I did some introspection about open source intelligence as a discipline, um, its importance, its evolving importance over time. Um, and, and I have a, a few thoughts that I'll share with you. Um, I think I'll spend the next 20 to 25 minutes or so sort of roughly talking about three things. And, and those are number one, open source intelligence as a potential partial solution to the malaise of uh, what we, I call the crisis of epistemology um, that's happening right now in Western countries. Um, number two, I'll talk about something that we at ISW are trying to help facilitate within the U.S. government, which we call the intelligence revolution. And then finally, I think I'll conclude by just getting into the nuts and bolts of my assessment of what's what's currently happening uh, around the theater uh, operationally within Ukraine. So crisis of epistemology. We live in the 21st century. Um, we live in the digital world. There's a tremendous amount of information out there. And uh, I think one of the things that is happening right now in academia, uh, among scholars, uh, among you know, educated populations, is we've become less sure about objective truth. Like, is there, you know, we, we tend to look at things now more shades of gray than we did, say, a, a century ago when things were more black and white. And, um, you know, with like postmodernist you know, philosophy, like people even sort of question the premise, like, is there an objective truth? Um, and foreign states exploit this, right? The Chinese, the Russians, they have entire disciplines of, of uh, information and influence operations that are predicated on the idea of we're just going to develop apathy within our target audience. We're going to try to convince them that an objective truth can't be known. Who knows what's happening in Xinjiang? Who knows what's happening in the battlefield in Ukraine and Russia, right? And this is designed in order to help uh, facilitate these states' strategies, their agendas, um, their very uh, physical lines of effort because they try to convince us. We don't know what's happening and they hope that we will simply just cede the ground to whatever these states want to do. Um, I, I've decisive, I mean, we can have a debate about sort of uh, epistemology and people's thoughts on it, but I would disagree that, that, that 
there is no such thing as an objective truth. I think that there is an objective truth in many instances, uh, at least more so than not, and it can and should be known. And open source intelligence as a discipline, I think, is an excellent tool for knowing that which can be known. Because now at open disposal is a tremendous amount of information. Um, and more important than the information is the methodology, the actual structured research and analytical techniques that you can apply to all kinds of new types of data sources that exist. And you can use it uh, to know what, what would previously only be possible to know if you live within the purview of uh, highly classified government environments. So for example, we can get really concrete about things that previously everyone would just say, or would sort of be hand waving and say, ah, oh, who, who the heck knows? I can assess with a high level of confidence and tell you how I think the Russian, the current state of the Russian campaign is going, um, because I, I can just objectify a whole lot of variables that one might use to, to create such an assessment. I can tell you with high level confidence that the Ukrainians incapacitate about a thousand Russian personnel per day. I can tell you with a high level of confidence that based off of open source confirmation of the movement of the forward line of own troops, Russian forces, they advance only about, you know, on average, uh, two square kilometers uh, per day in terms of the last six months of, of the combat. Um, I, I can tell you, for example, by looking at CCTV cameras from streets in Kiev and Bucha from 2022, um, what was the division that was responsible for the summary execution of civilians? And not only the division, but the regiment, and then tell you the regimental commander, and do that off of the identification of you know soldiers with unique equipment and kit that allows me to be able to ascertain their identities, which then can be shared with relevant uh, war crime prosecuting uh, officials, right? So we actually do know and can figure out a whole lot of these things and get really hard objective about the war. Um, most recently, uh, my organization has been until, uh, analytically advocating for policy changes to allow Western states, particularly the United States, to remove restrictions on rules of engagement so that the Ukrainians can be allowed to use long range precision fires against legitimate Russian military targets on the territory of the Russian Federation. Um, the retort that the uh, Biden administration has argued so far is that essentially um, there's no utility for letting the Ukrainians strike in Ukraine, uh, pardon me, in Russia because um, the, the line I like to use is that the Russians have redeployed aircraft from airfields that are within the range of, of the systems. And uh, I was kind of frustrated with that because I, uh, I'll i concede that they have indeed redeployed the permanent aircraft that they had based at, at 15 or 16 air bases within the range of ATACMS, tactical ballistic missiles. But that ignores what we know about the extent of Russia's known military infrastructure and land use uh, ammunition depots, fuel depots, command and control nodes, logistics uh, repair bases, right, uh, that are simply within the range of, of, of Ukrainian missiles and that we know that the Ukrainians are capable of striking. And so I, I created a geospatial intelligence map that shows just sort of the known locations of all of these infrastructure to say, look, okay, if you remove 15 or 16 of the air bases that whose locations are known, that's less than 10%, you still are looking at a target deck of stuff that's you know 90% still intact. And by the way, a lot of this really heavy infrastructure physically cannot be moved or, or protected readily. Uh, and I think the Ukrainian, you know, those catastrophic recent Ukrainian strikes against those uh, two Russian ammunition depots in Tvero Blast and the one across the Dark Cry over the past month have been demonstrative of that. So, um, look, we can know what can be known. OSINT is a great way to get about that. And it helps us get firm on, on our knowledge of the world and help shape policy, not from a place of vibes or feels or speculation, um, but from a more concrete uh, and informed place. And the beautiful thing about it is you don't need access to super, super secret swirl classified sources and means. Um, the second point uh, beyond the introduction the intelligence revolution. So the Institute for the Study of War, we have a, a, a an interesting uh, dual mission. Our, our first mission, of course, is to just inform policymakers and the public to advance uh, understanding of the national security threats and challenges that face the United States and our allies. Um, but a second part of it is also to help the intelligence community un better understand how to actually do intelligence work. Um, the 
we're in a very interesting time right now in the 21st century in the digital world. The th roughly 30 U.S. intelligence agencies that specialize in different uh, disciplines of intelligence, they were all designed for the pre-digital age. They were designed for the analog age when things were still being done pretty much just with basic electronics and mostly paper. And the old fight of the 20th century in the Cold War intelligence was for the fight for information. Because with, you know, the uh, the Iron Curtain and limited access to things and a non-existent internet, it was hard to find information. The paradigm has since been inversed. We now have a very open and interconnected world. There is a tremendous amount of information. And, and now the challenge is actually not the fight for information, but the fight for understanding and finding those kernels of, of, of understanding within a lot of signal, a lot of noise uh, within a very busy information space. And I would say that uh, when you're looking at the intelligence agencies, say you have the CIA, which focuses on human intelligence, you have the NSA that's focused on signals intelligence, and you have the, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is focused on your traditional military intelligence. Let's say that each of the three of them are doing collection and they're gathering uh, different pieces of information, technical collection, and let's say they're all looking at the same problem set. Uh, and you have analysts from those three different agencies and they have their assessments of what we're all looking at. Um, there's a challenge intrinsic to the bureaucratic structure that exists within our intelligence community, because for very good reasons for operational security, we make it hard for them to be able to talk to each other. And so unfortunately, when you sort of have these uh, siloed capabilities and siloed agencies, uh, it is not conducive to having uh, a synthetic, comprehensive, uh, all-source intelligence approach. And it contributes to intelligence failures. I mean, it's part of the reason why um, we had the intelligence failure around the September 11th attacks and why the uh, the Office of the, of the Director of National uh, uh, Intelligence was established. But suffice it to say, there still exists tremendous amount of red tape and to get your classified analysts from agency A and B and C to talk together on the same problem set. I mean, there's a huge time delay. There's a lot of red tape you got to work through. And um, it, it's if you're working with a time sensitive question, it's really a, a suboptimal way to go about uh, fixing this issue. The beauty with open source intelligence is that if you create a product using open source uh, means, then you can actually get a deliverable which is confined by zero of those bureaucratic restrictions for national security information. And you can actually take this document and use it as a means of tipping and queuing and say, hey, from the open source, we're able to get to this level of an assessment. Here's what we're seeing. And then that product can then seamlessly transition between all the relevant stakeholders and, and they can then take that for, for further interrogation within their classified end, which is a more efficient means. Currently, the U.S. intelligence community looks at um, open source as the following. They see it as uh, essentially the bacon bit garnishing that goes onto the end of a finished intelligence product after you've used your exquisite means of collection and, and analysis to build your 90% intelligence picture. And then that final 10% is just like the open source garnishing. Like, here's what we see on social media. Here's what we see in foreign language media, right? And, and that's sort of that. The Institute argues that we should actually inverse the model. For strategic intelligence, I'm confident that you can get a, at least a good, decent 50, perhaps 60% of the way there with open sources. Um, and that you should therefore use your no kidding, exquisite collection means to build out that remaining you know, 40% or 30% of the picture that you actually cannot see in open source. But what you do by embracing this inverted model is you have a more efficient allocation of resources because your exquisite collection uh, and, and you know, collectors and analysts who focus on a very specific thing, they're better able to point those resources into the no kidding things that you actually do need classified uh, resources for. Um, and number two, you end up with a synthetic product which um, of which more components are, are, not, are fundamentally not classified. Um, and it makes it easier for it to be able to pass through that, that membrane between the agencies and make it more shareable. Uh, and I think we all know how valuable it is to have uh, intelligence that is not sequestered off behind a million black boxes, but that is actually more shareable because it becomes more actionable. Um, and the other thing that I'd say about OSINT is uh, analysts and practitioners need to rethink how we think about OSINT. 
if you look at intelligence and all the subdisciplines, OSINT, uh, HUMINT, uh, SIGINT, et cetera, a lot of times people see OSINT as just another one of the ints, and it's sort of like open source information that you find on social media, uh, media monitoring from foreign governments, you know, that, that sort of thing. It's a lot more than that. I would actually argue that OSINT, when done properly, is all source intelligence, because from OSINT, you can pull in your stuff that you traditionally think about, media monitoring and the like, and et cetera. But you can also pull in commercially available uh, data that is being collected by private companies. Um, Planet and Maxar will provide you your electro-optical information. ISI will provide you your synthetic aperture radar. Hawkeye 360 will provide you your radio frequency. Yes, you can collect data on radio frequency. That is, if you know a Russian submarine or a Russian field uh, radio operates at, say, I don't know, 1500 megahertz, you can, there's a, there is a space borne sensor that you can specify and say, hey, I want to image this section of the world looking for devices emanating uh, on the uh, magnetic electro, uh, you know, wavelength frequency at this, at this specified thing, and they will collect it for you for, for a fee. Um, you can purchase actually even the precision location data for, for cell phone and mobile devices from a variety of private vendors as well. Um, right. So this is sort of like stuff that the NSA would do, stuff that the uh, NRO and the, uh, the, the the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency would do, right? And what you can do at OSINT now, thanks to the innovation in, in the private sector and especially commercial space technology is you can bring all this stuff in into under the rubric of OSINT, it's an all source understanding where you do your research together to fuse it and come to a comparable product um, for um, your intelligence consumer. Um, and the final thing I'll also add in, in this regards is OSINT is not just a collection of data. Um, I think oftentimes people think that access to data and collection to data uh, of data is a ipso facto guarantee that you're going to have a, a solid intelligence product. It's actually, that's not the case. You can have a lot of data, but then it's unintelligible and difficult to sort through. Again, the fight is not for information, it's for, it's for understanding and knowledge. And I would argue that you take the best things that the intelligence community has, which are structured analytical techniques, uh, a disciplined way of actually studying the data that you collect, and then um, the, met the underlying trade card, the methodology. And then instead of using that with classified sources, just sick those proven uh, tradecraft best practices, apply that to the data that is now available in the open source, and you do indeed arrive at a comparable product. Um, and, and I think that's really where there's a lot of utility to be had. Um, so it's it's beyond just what's going on in different places and in the q and I'd be happy to talk about some of the, the tradecraft and methodology um, and so on and so forth. So that brings us now uh, finally to Ukraine. Um, where do we sit at Ukraine? Uh, um, we could talk about this topic for hours, honestly. Very happy to get into the weeds uh, in Q&A, but I'll share my sort of hopefully five or so minute uh, top line assessment for um, the strategic down to the tactical levels of war for what's going on right now. Whenever I talk about the war in Ukraine, I like to ground it within the first the, the strategic assessment of, of uh, the belligerent's objectives. I think Vladimir Putin's uh, objective at, at the at the strategic or grand strategic level is to seize all of Ukraine and destroy the political entity known as the Ukrainian state. Um, Vladimir Putin does not care about the eastern and southern regions of Ukraine, which he has declared annexed um, as the be-all end-all. He does not just want access to, a, you know, a warm Black Sea port and Sebastopol or anything like that. Yes, he wants those things too, but that's not sufficient. He wants to eliminate the idea of, of, of Ukraine and he wants to seize the entire country. He, of course, does not have the means to do that. He attempted that in 2022 and, and failed, um, but his objective has not changed. And Vladimir Putin has adopted a strategy um, that is predicated on not individual excellence of his military or of his generals or small units or the maneuvers, but instead leaning into mass and a protracted war of indeterminate length in which over time, generally, the West uh, political cohesion to continue supporting Ukraine will degrade, at which point the Russians will just slowly and gradually steamroll and sort of pick apart Ukraine through death through a thousand cuts, be it over the course of many years. And to that end, Vladimir Putin's strategy actually seeks to exploit operational pauses, 
um, protracted ceasefires, armistices, cessation of hostility, however you want to call it, because he will use that time period as places and time, space time to reconstitute his military, uh, leverage the territory he currently occupies as a lodgment for which he can then use to springboard for more successful military operations, and ideally in the interim, get some sanctions removed so we can start importing some of those important intermediary goods that are important for Russia's uh, military and industrial base. Um, and so that's sort of Putin's, that's Putin's uh, strategic objective and, and where he's going at right now. Um, the Ukrainian objective is, of course, to liberate their people, uh, liberate their territory, uh, and ensure that Ukraine can exist as a uh, financially solvent and, and defensible state. Um, and beyond that, you know, we can talk about other other actors' objectives here. But, but fundamentally, that those are the objectives. And I would argue that, from the perspective of the United States and for NATO, it's in our unequivocal interest that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is decisively defeated, and that uh, Ukraine regains all of its people and all of its territory for a variety of reasons, um, both of which are just generally good for the liberal democratic world order. Um, but also from a, a selfish perspective as an American and someone who lives in Washington, um, just from a real politic, you know, American uh, uh, reasons. Um, operationally, let's talk about sort of what the Russian uh, theory of operations is. I will now share my screen and show a map uh, to illustrate some of this. So this is the current control of terrain around the theater in Ukraine. And the Russian theory right now is that uh, they want to ensure that the Ukrainians never decisively accumulate the forces and manpower to conduct a significant counteroffensive operation that liberate operationally significant sort of swaths of Ukrainian territory, like how the Ukrainians did in 2022. To that end, uh, in 2023, the Russians adopted a campaign design that is designed to fix Ukrainian forces and brigades all around this roughly, I believe it's 2,600 kilometer theater, which includes the international border with Belarus, which is why the Belarusians continue conducting provocations and exercises there and the Russians maintain forces there, um, which includes keeping Ukrainians not in the parts of where the front line of occupied Ukraine are, but at the international border with Russia near Kharkiv, which is why the Russians conducted a cross border, border um, operation on May 10th of this year. And which also includes the international border around Kursk and Bryansk. Part of the reason the Ukrainians conducted a counteroffensive, or pardon me, an offensive operation into Kursk uh, last month was in part a spoiling operation because the Russians were assembling a force group in Kursk to do another cross border operation, very similarly to how they did slightly to the southeast uh, in Belgorod and to Kharkiv in May. The Russian theory is therefore, if they can just maintain an artillery advantage, a manpower mass advantage, it doesn't matter that the Russians crawl at a very slow pace. It doesn't matter that their units and their equipment are not superior to the Ukrainian equivalent. Simply, they'll just grind through it and they will therefore be able to, over time, uh, achieve a victory. Putin's strategic vision and his campaign design is entirely predicated on the center of gravity for this war um, decisively falling in his favor. The center of gravity for this war, I would argue, is not whatever happens operationally on the ground in Ukraine. It is not the tactics of how many more hundreds of kilometers the Russians inch closer to Pokrovsk or something. The center of gravity for this war is, in fact, what do a handful, perhaps a couple hundred key decision makers in Washington, Brussels, London, uh, Berlin, and Paris decide about this war? Because if you look at the gross domestic product of the NATO alliance and the other major allies that are supporting uh, Ukraine's defense, I include uh, in that, for example, countries like Korea, who have a big advanced defense industrial base and who have been sending a tremendous amount of material to Ukraine. Um, and you compare that against the Russian GDP, and even if you augment it with the GDP of the North Koreans and the Iranians, um, we completely obliterate the Russians in all objective matters. Um, we have not been decisive in our support of Ukraine. We've sort of given Ukraine enough to not fail, but not never succeed. And we continue to restrain the Ukrainians and impose uh, limitations that, that American and NATO generals would never impose on their own forces if they were faced with a similar challenge. And I would argue that, look, Putin understands that 
if the West coheres a strategic clarity and they understand that it is indeed in their interest to decisively defeat this operation, the, the Russian invasion, um, and if we do something akin to, say, a Lend-Lease plan for Ukraine, where our level of support is not contingent on, well, how, how sort of the feeling about the war in Ukraine going as of this month, but instead look at our strategic vision that the Russian invasion be defeated and therefore our our support level is not going to be contingent on the ebbs and flows of the theater um, or politics, but rather um, we'll do whatever we have to to get to that predetermined and, and uh, desired end goal, then, then Putin loses uh, because we have not developed that strategic clarity. And I would argue that Putin's, the way that he wages this war at the tactical level of war and at the operational level of war, it's designed... Uh, to further information operations and further um, narratives and memes and meta narratives about the war and about the Russian military, which are meant to uh, deny us from getting us to that point of strategic clarity. So, for example, when the Russians leaned into the Battle of Bakhmut last year and they eventually seized the city, um, the Russians lost it all visually confirmed. They lost about three mechanized divisions worth of equipment for Bakhmut, which is a town of around, you know, pre-war 60 or 70,000 or so. Oh, and this occurred over a protracted period and it destroyed the Wagner group. Um, that's not a worth a trade at the tactical level nor at the operational level. I'd note that since the, since Bakhmut fell around you know, spring 2023, well over a year ago, the Russians have not advanced. They've impaled themselves here. They've, they've advanced a grand total of a, no more than 10 kilometers to the west of Bakhmut in that elapsed time. But what the Russians did achieve with the Battle of Bakhmut and these continued tactic of these attritional um, wave meat assaults is they reinforce the, the, the myths that you can't defeat Russia. Russia has infinite men. The, the, you, you kill a million Russians, they'll send two million more. And therefore, sort of, there's no, there's no prospect of possibly defeating the Russians and the Russian military is Teflon. And um, there's just no possible way that you, that you can defeat mass. Like that is a Russian narrative um, that well, we know is not true. We do know things about the Russian force generation limitations, the strains the system is under, um, and, and that we actually can, we can afford plan for a place in time where the Russians will be vulnerable and we can push on them. And we should actually, instead of trying to prevent any sort of catastrophic Russian failure, which is whatever, which is what we we try to do. In fact, our policy is designed to have a series of inertia dampeners and blockers to prevent the Russians from from experiencing failure. Um, we should instead lean into it and try to find accelerants. Um, so uh, that that's what's happening um, at the, sort of the high operational level. Current operational level. Here's what's going on. The Russians up until last month had the initiative across the entire theater. They were using the initiative to be able to conduct attacks uh, whenever and wherever and at what echelon and scale and intensity that the Russians desired, um, forcing the Ukrainians to divert forces and prevent them from accumulating forces for a, a counteroffensive. Um, for example, the Kharkiv operation successfully managed to pull elements of some very good Ukrainian brigades from uh, the Bakhmut area uh, up to the north. Again, stretching the Ukrainians then, preventing them from being able to mount anything significant in the future. Um, and this was really a, a sort of a death cycle where the Russian Python bow constrictor continues to constrict around Ukraine in the theater, and they really have no means of doing anything. The Ukrainians took a, a, a risky operation uh, last month with their Kursk incursion. They have seized the initiative in the northern part of the theater. They flipped the script. And, and actually now impose some dilemmas on the Russians. And there's a very interesting discussion we can have about um, the strategic and high operational dilemmas that Kursk imposes on the Russians. It, no, it's not just about territory. No, it's not just about uh, trading space. It's actually about re-engaging uh, an entire 1,000 kilometers worth of frontage, which essentially the Russians do not properly defend, um, and that Putin effectively gets to enjoy for free. Um, and the strategic resourcing required to actually properly defend this to prevent any further Ukrainian uh, re, uh, incursions in the future. Um, the Russians at this time, they are leaning into their current uh, operational objective, which is to seize the operationally significant city of Pokrovsk, 
uh, in, in eastern Ukraine. They continue to make tactical gains in this direction. The Russians seized Avdivka back in April, and since then they've advanced roughly 30 kilometers towards Pokrovsk. Again, these are not rapid advances, so everything you might have read, that which I personally think is hyperbolic about rapid Russian advance, the rapid you know Ukrainian deterioration in the Pokrovsk direction. Look, over the course of five, six months, the Russians managed to advance about 30 kilometers. I mean, this is not this is not World War II maneuver or anything approximating it. It's, it's, it has to be taken into context. Um, the Russians are, as of you know, as of today, uh, intensifying offensive operations near another uh, significant uh, town called Vuladar in the south. The Russians began offensive operations around Vuladar on September 1st. Um, I think the Russians will likely seize the city. Uh, the question is sort of when, but it, it's not going to prove decisive for the Russians. Um, if and when they seize it, because uh, they still have a lot of terrain to go through that is not preferable to Russian maneuver, because it's open fields with no cover and concealment that the Ukrainians are very adept at denying maneuver through. Um, as the Russian advance near Pokrovsk has slowed and stalled out over the last two weeks, the Russians have been instead, I think, pushing north from Vuladar and pushing south of the salient to Pokrovsk towards um, these villages and settlements here. I think the Russians are trying to broaden and widen their penetration for the salient um, here to help facilitate um, a renewed push against Pokrovsk in the future. So I expect more of this pocket to be collapsed in the coming weeks. Um, but fundamentally, these are all just tactical villages and settlements which are not decisive for Ukraine's war effort. And I'd note on the map this hard black line, which is the territory where the, the jumping off point for where the Russian military started uh, in 2022, when the renewed offensive began. Um, so it's actually not moved a whole all that much in this area, and it's been quite, quite conservative. Um, the bottom line is, look, the Ukrainians have uh, many intrinsic advantages against the Russians. The only real intrinsic advantages that the Russians have over the Ukrainians are mass, uh, both of personnel and materiel, and then the Russian way, uh, the Russian strategic clarity, um, the fact that Russia is a authoritarian state that doesn't have to deal with uh, civil military uh, considerations and the, the political leadership in the Kremlin simply can demand anything it wants of the military at all times, which in some regards is a benefit because in democratic states, we have to, we have to come to a consensus on what to do. Um, and then the final one is the Russians' ability to be able to cohere a strategic vision and work concretely towards it, which is something that we're not able to do. But in terms of equipment, um, I think uh, individual officer and unit and soldier level excellence, um, innovation uh, at the tactical level, uh, the Ukrainians are superior in those regards. And in terms of intelligence, the Ukrainians are also superior in that regard. And truly, whatever happens within the war in Ukraine, um, it is within our hands. We we are the makers of our own future. If we decide to lean into supporting the Ukrainians decisively and removing the roadblocks and the uh, inertia dampeners that we have given the Russians, um, then we can impose dilemmas on the Russians and we can do things to cause their war to fail. Um, but there's a there remains a suite of, of policies and, and options that we have decided to not not undertake at this time. So. Um, I think I'll, I'll conclude with my remarks there and I'll be very happy to, to get into the Q and A.